Hello and welcome to Criminal Justice in a Nutshell. Today's episode is Special Needs. We're going to be dealing with intensive supervision programs. I'll be calling it ISP from here on out, or the specialized caseloads. As many of you know, I was a probation officer there in San Angelo and down in Alpine, and I had a specialized caseload. I was an ISP supervisor. And the ISP caseloads include substance abuse, which is what I did, uh, mental illness caseloads, uh, sex offenders, and known gang members. These are the specialized caseloads that we have within the ISP. Now, the ISP is an enhanced form of community supervision. It includes closer surveillance, uh, which also includes increased number of visits, both in the office and at home, at work, and other places, additional conditions. Okay, my offenders were released from a long-term residential therapeutic community, more commonly known as a court residential treatment facility. When they got out of the CRTC, they came and they were on my caseload for six months to a year, depending on the severity of their substance abuse issues and the problems that they had with relapse and other things like that. But I'd go to out to their house once or twice a month. They come to my office uh, every week. They would do your analysis every time I saw them. If I saw them in my office, they would do your analysis. If I saw them at home, they'd do your analysis. If I went on a special visit to their job, we would go into the restroom at their place of employment and we'd do a drug test. They came back negative. All things were good. Uh, there's also additional conditions, which include additional visitations. They include search uh, issues like searching your home, searching your computer, searching um, your car, uh, searching your refrigerator. I had a substance abuse person on my caseload that one of their conditions was that there would be no alcohol in the house, including rubbing alcohol. And once a month, I would go search their house looking for alcohol, looking for, you know, booze, looking for rubbing alcohol, which is really, really sad. Um, they also have additional treatment requirements. And we'll talk about the different levels of treatment in, in a little bit. But the ISP started in the 1950s in California with the idea, the thought that enhanced supervision would increase the chances for rehabilitation. These are specialized cases. They have offenders, or in the probation world, we call them defendants, that have special needs. They, they have issues that we need to deal with. So as a way to deal with them, uh, they get additional supervision. And one of the outcomes of this is that the officers had smaller caseloads. When I was a general probation officer, I had a caseload of between 150 and 200 defendants uh, that I would supervise month to month. When I got the specialized caseload, uh, seeing my caseload was substance abuse, I had 70 people on my caseload. And what happened and what we found was in the 1980s and 90s, as we were going through this, we found that the probation officers had more opportunity to supervise and give one-on-one -on -one attention, which in turn created an opportunity where more people were failing and people were not being successful on the ISP because the probation officers were finding more technical violations. And because of the technical violations, you know, they got revoked and got sent to prison. And ISP almost went belly up. It almost became extinct. So what they did and the changes that they've made in the 21st century is that high-risk offenders are, and only high-risk offenders are chosen for the ISP. Okay. Supervision include, also had to include intensive therapy. Okay. And because we have intensive supervision and we have offenders or defendants that have serious problems, they also needed serious treatment. So they instituted cognitive behavioral change therapy. And through cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, we looked for and has tried to establish a change in the mentality and change of the thinking 
of each of these offenders. Okay, the next change that we saw with ISPs is that offenders were allowed a certain degree of non-compliance, especially with technical issues. Because we were dealing with rehabilitation at the drug court level, at the substance abuse level, there were certain infractions that were overlooked. One of the things that we did was that as long as the offender did not change drugs, they could relapse and they could use again once or twice or three times. Um, we would just modify their conditions of probation. Okay. Every single one of my defendants, when they got out of CRTC, they were required to go to individual counseling twice a week, and they had to go to group therapy once a week, and they had to go to AA every single day. Okay. And what they would do is they would go to the leader of the AA meeting, and he would stamp their little card. And, you know, what well, if they relapsed and they reused the same drug and the drug of their choice, you know, we would increase the number of AA visits to twice a day or three times a day. Um, we would increase individual counseling to every day or group therapy to twice a week, you know, depending on what was necessary and needed. There were technical violations that were ignored. Uh, breaking curfew. You know, breaking curfew is a reason to get your probation revoked. But, you know, and we used it as a tool to threaten uh, our defendants. But we, you know, really didn't because our job was to try and make successful rehabilitation. Okay, so the last thing we did was that personal contact with the offender was increased. Okay, where your regular probation or parole defendant is seen in the office once a month they might be seen at home once a quarter um, depending on their the risk needs that we covered last week depending on what was necessary to make them successful is what we did when you get on isp you're seeing these defendants all the time three or four times a month um, you're using home visits and office visits and phone calls you're doing employment checks uh, and you're doing all of these things to keep an eye on your offender. Okay, the rate of success is not based upon technical violations or re or revocations, so or lack of revocations. What we rate success on is recidivism. Has this person been arrested again? Has this person returned to a life of crime? 10 to 15% of the defendants on probation, parole, qualify for ISP, and that's it. There's not a whole lot of people that qualify. Only your hardcore uh, offenders are put on ISP. So, substance abuse. You know, like I've shared, I was a substance abuse officer. One third of new prison admissions. Okay. One out of three people that are admitted into prison are there because of drugs and alcohol. You know, 33% of the people in our prisons are there because they have a substance abuse problem. And the idea of the substance abuse caseloads is to keep these nonviolent offenders out of prison, out of jail, and in the community, and we can work with helping them overcome their substance abuse problems. It is reported that half of all the offenders that are in prison, uh, were under some form of substance abuse uh, at the time of their offense. They're in prison for something else, but they had a substance abuse problem that led to that other felony. And that's, like I said, it's, a, it's reported, and your textbook says, um, that around half of everybody in prison is there because of a substance abuse problem. Treatment for substance abuse is a lot more effective than punishment. You can punish somebody all day long, but as soon as they're finished with punishment, if you haven't addressed and dealt with the substance abuse problem that they have, you're going to find yourself re-offending re and getting arrested again. So we have set up the need for treatment. And quality treatment varies upon the severity of the substance abuse problem. 
Okay, then if you look on page 100, 135 of your textbook, figure 6.1, you're going to see this figure. It has a little arrow that goes, goes up at a little arc. You know, and at the bottom of that arc, it says drug education. You can go to DWI school. You can go to drug school. Um, you can, you know, to learn about drugs, the D.A.R.E. program. You know, D.A.R.E. to drug and alcohol resistance education programs are available. And sometimes that's all that's needed. Okay, the next step up is aftercare and relapse prevention. Uh, this includes Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous. Um, this includes drug tests and urinalysis screenings to make sure that the offenders are not using again. The next level is outpatient, individual, and group therapy. Uh, and these group sessions or these individual sessions are intended to help create cognitive behavioral change. To cognitive behavioral therapy is intended to change the way an individual thinks. And if we can change your attitude and change the way individuals think, then we can turn around and help you overcome your substance abuse problem. There's short-term inpa short inpatient therapy. Uh, this is up to six weeks. Uh, and up to six weeks, there's only so much that can be done. And if you have a hardcore substance abuse problem, it's not going to work, but it's the next step. It's the next step up in trying to help an offender, a defendant, a substance abuser to overcome their substance abuse problems. The last step is the long-term therapeutic communities. In the state of Texas, that is the CRTC, which is the Court Residential Treatment Facility, and it is the SAFEP, also known as the Substance Abuse Felony Punishment Facility. And both of these facilities last from six weeks up. Uh, you could find yourself in safety for up to nine months trying to overcome your substance abuse problems. Some of the obstacles to overcoming substance abuse is, and some of the obstacles to successful supervision, include quality drug treatment. Okay. Here in Big Spring, there is no real quality drug treatment program. We have to ship people off to somewhere else. There in San Angelo, or down in San Angelo, there is the women's CRTC over next to SWIT, not, not next to SWIT, but next to um, the Howard College campus there in San Angelo. Um, you have the women's right next door, and across the loop and down the road about a half a mile, you see the men's CRTC. The, the Roy Robb CRTC used to be a juvenile probation residential juvenile probation center but it was converted to a men's crtc kind of once you relieve are released from those programs you revert back and you start going back to the outpatient therapy you go to aa you do your analysis screenings uh, you give more drug education and you run the the hill backwards downhill Okay, the lack of space in local community-based programs. If you don't have any space to send somebody, you know, you're going to have a harder time helping this individual overcome. And then the limited ability to mandatory treatment. And because of these lack of treatment facilities, a lack of qualified drug treatment specialists, we find ourselves facing relapse, and offenders are going to be using again. Okay, and relapse events should be responded to with a graduated sanctions. You don't just first time they use, send them off to prison. Okay, you want to graduate those, those sanctions because it's necessary and important to do so. You know, the first time you get an offense, you increase their AA or you increase their counseling. The Revocation is the absolute last resort. Um, drug court is a way to help keep addicts out of prison. Uh, this program lasts normally a year. Uh, it has intensive number of treatment programs. It has inpatient, outpatient um, programs. It has a detox program, uh, group and individual counseling, uh, and AA. The next specialized group and I've just looked down at the clock, so we're going to be going a little long. I know these videos normally last about 15 minutes, but this one's going to go long, as we've got a lot to cover in this chapter. 
Okay, the mental health caseloads are another form of specialized caseloads. Because of the deinstitutionalization of the mental health hospitals around the country, all of these people with mental health issues find themselves out in the street. Then they get into trouble and they go to jail and they end up in prison. The jails and prisons in our country are the largest mental health institutions in the country because we don't know what to do with these offenders who have mental illnesses. So they've established the mental health courts and mental health courts uh, is only for those people who have an, what's called an AXIS-1 diagnosis in accordance with the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. If you have an AXIS-1 diagnosis, um, that will be your primary problem. And almost always the secondary problem is a substance abuse problem. They're self-medicating to try and overcome their mental illness and the problems that they have. If you have a recognized mental health issue, you can, as a way to avoid these individuals from being convicted and beginning a negative profile, you took the, the offenders are placed on the mental health court system okay? and it helps them adjust and help make sure that they're on their medications, make sure that they're doing the things that they need to do to become successful and it keeps them out of prison. The next is the veterans courts. And I was a little shocked to find that there's a veterans court within the mental health special caseload. Um, it almost offended me. One in five veterans, okay, one in five people that you know that were in the military suffer from some form of PTSD. Okay, and of those, less than half of them will seek medical treatment. Less than So we've got a whole bunch of veterans running around with a... PTSD problem and they're not seeking treatment for it. So once they're identified, because we really don't want to just send our veterans to prison, especially if they have a mental health issue. If they have a mental health issue, it can be identified and they can be handled through a diversionary program to help keep those veterans out of jail and help them avoid convictions. PTSD is a very serious problem amongst veterans and we owe it to the veterans to take care of them and to make sure that they have a successful opportunity to reintegrate into civilian society instead of sending them to jail. The next specialized caseload is the sex offender caseload. The sex offender caseload is a special caseload with special circumstances. The offenders that are find themselves on the sex offender caseload range from exposing yourself in public to rape, including sex acts with children. Okay, pedophiles are most likely, and what we found and what the studies have shown is that sex offenders or child sex offenders, pedophiles, were abused as children themselves and they're just precipitating or reciprocating the cycle of child molestation. Uh, rapists, we have found, have serious anger management problems and also substance abuse issues. Okay? And they're not, being, they're not able to adequately deal with the rage that runs in their body. So they take it out in the form of rape and sexual assault. 60% of all sex offenders are walking the streets they're on community supervision. They're not in prison. They are your next door neighbor. They're the guys living down, and girls living down the street. Okay, this, the next thing, if we've got 60% of our population, of our sex offender population on the streets, in the community, it begs the question, can we treat sex offenders? And this would be a great big humongous debate to have in one of the classes, although we're not having that debate today. Um... So what we've decided and what we do for sex offenders is not so much treat it, but contain it. We contain it by preventing sex offenders from being able to have the opportunity to commit sex offenses. You get face-to-face -face visits two to four times a month. You get home visits. You get two uh, home and computer searches every single month. 
And Jonathan was the guy that I worked with down in San Angelo. He was a sex offender. And well, it's not he was a sex offender. He was on the sex offender caseload. He was a probation officer for the sex offenders. And we would go do our home visits together. And we would go to one of his defendant's houses and we would search his house. He had this little jump drive and he'd plug it into the computer and this computer would run a search and look for porn uh, in, in the computer. And because I also have prison experience and a prison background, I would search his house for, you know, Playboys and, you know, gentlemen's magazines, the hustlers. I'd look for, you know, with the child offenders, I would look for the J.C. Penney's catalogs and the Sears catalogs. And I'd look for things where they had pictures of little boys and girls in underwear. Um, there was one offender that I went to their house and I pulled the sheets off of his bed and he had little girls panties lined up on his bed all underneath the sheets. Um, needless to say, they revoked him and sent him to prison. Uh, but you look for those things that just absolutely freak you out with sex offenders. Okay, you have a cognitive behavioral group therapy. We're trying to change the way that you think. If we can change those things that cause you sexual arousal, um, then we can, you know, supposedly we can treat you and make you better. Uh, regular polygraph tests and exams. And you put, you know, you're strapped to a polygraph machine and they ask you about your sexual desires. They ask you about your sexual activity. They ask you about the things that you have done. Um, and it also requires a lot of teamwork between the probation parole officer and the treatment team. As long as everybody is working together on the same page, um, we can find positive change. I don't know if it's treating and we're curing, curing anybody, but we are giving them tools, giving these sex offenders tools to be able to overcome their urges and how to avoid those things that trigger those urges. Um, the last thing that they use, and I can never pronounce this properly, um, but I'm going to try it and then you can laugh at me in the discussions, but it's called a penile plethysmograph. See, I, I really don't know how to pronounce it, but it's a plethysmograph. And what it does is it measures, you know, it, it puts these probes on, uh, the testicles and on the penis of sex offenders. And then they put pictures in front of them and it measures the level of, uh, erecti erectile response and you know it finds out you know the sexual desire uh, they can also address this with Depo-Provera uh, which is a medication used to decrease sexual desire the sex offender registry currently there are 728,000 convicted sex offenders in the United States a hundred thousand of them are not registered they've escaped their supervision um, in the state of Oregon or the state of Oregon, sex offender databases are not made public. So a lot of sex offenders move to Oregon. They still register as sex offenders, um, but they do not, they, they do not have to, that list is not made public. So you don't know if your next door neighbor is a sex offender. Okay. The last sub, the last specialized caseload we're going to talk about is gang members. Um, gang members are normally young offenders between the ages of 12 and 20, 25. Uh, they are most likely, of all the people that we've talked about today, they're the most likely to be rearrested. Uh, information clearing houses uh, are put together, and there's a nationwide database that has been put together that helps identify gangs. It creates gang profiles. It helps you be able to identify gang members by their tattoos. There's the interpretation of stacking. It gives you gang histories. And then, you know, each state has their own investigative bureau that will investigate the gang profiles and give individual gang profiles of gang members. Probation and police should spend a lot of time communicating together because you know, we've got this gang issue in this country and we need to overcome and address that gang issue. Okay, so um, 
in order to combat gang problems. It requires increased visitation from the probation officer to the defendants uh, to help ensure and maintain a separation, a degree of separation between the defendant and the gang that they are members of. There's also a mentorship program, and it's really good to establish a mentorship program with those gang bangers who have either either aged out of the pro, out of the gangs, um, or somehow they're no longer affiliated with the gangs, to help these young offenders and young defendants to get out of the gangs themselves and break free of the gangs. Okay, so today's discussion has two parts. Okay, the first part the first part of the discussion group is how many chances should be given to drug court offenders before they're considered to have failed the program and to move them on to conviction. Because drug court is normally a diversionary program, you complete this program and we set you free, we eliminate, we expunge your arrest and everything is done. Okay, the second part of this is how would your response be different for addicts in a therapeutic community or like the probation officer, you finished CRTC, you finished SAFEP, how much leeway would you give to those offenders as opposed to the drug court? How many opportunities do you give to offenders? Um, and we're just gonna stick with substance abuse uh, because I really don't know that you know, we wanna put a limit on as long as they're not getting rearrested for the mental health issues. And I don't want any leeway given to the sex offenders. So let's just stick with the substance abuse problems at the moment. Uh, the second is a the case study is special needs. Um, you're going to be setting individualized terms of probation for three offenders. You're going to read the case loads of three offenders, or the, the, the case study of three offenders, and then you're going to set the additional probation um, criteria or probation conditions that you would want for that. This is John Fisher. Uh, and this has been in Criminal Justice in a Nutshell, episode Special Needs and ISP or Intensive Supervision Programs. Again, my name is John Fisher. I hope you have a blessed day and have a good night.